Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, or if you're new here, welcome officially to the channel. This is a series where we look at various different oddities in gaming that developers either made to help the player get more into the game, visually or physically. Most have had influences on games and designs years past when they were active, and today's no exception, because today we're going to look at a rather cool attachment that was vastly ahead of its time, the Sega Channel Adapter. Stop just watching TV. Welcome to Sega Channel. It's cable, but you don't watch it, you play it. Your Genesis is hooked up to about 50 games a month, like Sonic and Knuckles, Earthworm Jim, and Super Street Fighter 2. Get secret tips and test drive new games before they're out. Play what you want for as long as you want for one monthly fee. Sega Channel, stop just watching TV. Now imagine you're back in 1994, bad color schemes and all. Your parents get cable and one of them comes home with an odd looking box. It looks like part cartridge and part cable box and has some sort of weird RF plug-in. Your mom tells you that it's for you to play games with. You obviously give her an odd look like, come on mom, some, someone ripped you off. But you know, it's your mom, so you humor her by plugging in the cartridge, getting the cable line connected to it and boot up your Genesis. Well. Now it's after connecting a power adapter to the unit, because you know, Sega needs a power adapter for, well, everything. Let's be honest. I swear, every time I view something for Sega that's an attachment, 90% of the time it needs some form of power brick. It's so pervasive that I often just get this image every time I talk about them. Hey, I think I know what's wrong. Jokes aside, this looks like a pretty cool idea, so let's take a look at this thing a little bit closer, shall we? What this was is an online gaming streaming service of sorts. Much like how television pioneered this in the early 1980s with the play cable service, and Nintendo would actually try this again with the Famicom by putting a modem on it later in its lifespan, which would actually only really see a release in Japan. It never had a stateside release. You could now connect your cable provider to your Genesis and play games for a nominal fee of $13 a month with a $25 one-time connection fee. Once online, you'd be greeted with a menu of various different titles that you could download into the RAM of the adapter and play the game. It sounds like another service that seems to have gotten a lot of attention the last few years in gaming. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. Just kidding. The service wouldn't just offer those titles though, it offered straight up rentals known as express games. These were titles that would not hit the channel for another 90 days or more, but could be accessed earlier for a nominal fee of $2.95. This would get you access to the game for roughly 48 hours. On top of these features, the service even had contests that would challenge players like on say Primal Rage, where they challenged players to beat the game as fast as possible. As soon as you did, you'd be given an 800 number to call, and the first X number of players to succeed would get an undisclosed prize. These were actually fairly successful events, not only for Sega, but for Time Warner Cable, one of the main supporters of the short-lived service, as multiple other events like Mortal Kombat 2, Earthworm Jim 2 would also appear on the system. All this sounds pretty great, right? So why didn't it really take off? Well, there were a few reasons. One was the timing. This thing launched in 1994, like I said before. That was very, very deep into the Genesis life cycle. And we already had a lot of attachments. We had the Sega Converter that played 8-bit games from the Master System, the Sega CD, and the 32X. And the Saturn was just around the corner. And I think you can already see part of the issue. The Saturn itself. Sega was pushing hard to try to get the 32X and Saturn up and going on top of the fact that the Sega channel itself only really had Time Warner supporting it from a cable perspective. Lastly, you had more and more competition from people's gaming dollar entering the market with the PlayStation also coming out in 1994 in Japan and late 1995 in the United States. On top of having all this going on, a lot of people including myself had no idea this thing existed and no idea how to get it. You often had to get this directly through your cable provider or mail order the unit and hope it would be compatible with your current cable provider. So it was the fact that it had $13 a month fee and a $25 connection fee, which made entry a little steep for people in the 90s, 
on top of difficulty being able to actually find the thing or even know it existed on top of that and new consoles just around the corner that everybody was looking to move to, it's surprising it had such a long lifespan. It ran until July 1998, pretty much at the end of the month, partially due to the contest and partially being one of the only ways to play certain games. Golden Axe 3 primarily comes to mind with this, which only had a physical release in Japan and could only be played by American gamers through the Sega channel. Still to this day, there is no American release if you want to play this game, you basically have to emulate it at this point. But what do you guys think of this one? Did you actually have this service? And if so, what was your impression of it? Let me know in the comments. For now though, thank you for spending part of your day with me. If you could do me one more favor, please leave this video a like. And if you're not, consider subscribing. It really helps my channel out. For now though, enjoy the rest of your day, and until next time, happy gaming.